This is Nursing Australia, proudly brought to you by APNA, the Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association. Hello and welcome to Nursing Australia. I'm Suzanne Blackaby. For many of us primary healthcare nurses, it's our time to shine, with the COVID vaccine Phase B beginning. So it's time to start immunising the general population. And for some primary healthcare nurses, you've been leading the way with Phase 1A being rolled out for over a month now. And for those not involved in the rollout, don't underestimate the important role you continue to play in answering all those questions from patients, family, friends, and even randoms on social media. All nurses are playing an important role in reinforcing that vaccines are safe and effective. In this episode, we dive into record, recall, and report for the COVID vaccines. We need to check what their vaccine status is. We check on air. We can do that via my health record if you wish. We're going to go through consenting and then um, discussing, communicating with your patient about dose two and what does this look like. And we hear from the Stroke Foundation's Madison Trudell on how primary care nurses can best care for patients with stroke. So people can have weakness, numbness, paralysis, um, dizziness, loss of balance. You can have a thunderclap headache, which is common with hemorrhagic strokes, um, loss of vision, double vision, or decreased vision. So there are a lot of different presentations. Then we take a little time out for ourselves with the nurse wellness segment. Nurse Sarah Cosgrave shares some relaxation techniques just for us. But first, the news. Phase 1B of the COVID vaccine rollout begins. Aussie-made AstraZeneca vaccine comes online and flooding on the East Coast affects already hard-hit communities. This is Nursing Australia News. Hello, I'm Matthew St Ledger. The long-awaited Phase 1B of the COVID vaccine rollout has begun across the country with practice nurses doing the bulk of the heavy lifting. About 1,000 practices have now begun the vaccination process with over 6 million Australians eligible to be vaccinated during this phase. This includes Aboriginal people over 55 years old, non-Aboriginal people over 70, key workers such as police and firefighters, and healthcare workers not captured during Phase 1A. The vaccine being used in Phase 1B is the Oxford AstraZeneca Vax. The TGA this week approved 800,000 made doses to be rolled out, decreasing our reliance on offshore made vaccines. Meanwhile, in Europe, most countries that temporarily suspended the rollout of the Oxford AstraZeneca have now started to roll out the vaccine once again, as investigations into blood clotting events found there was likely no link. AstraZeneca said an independent safety committee conducted a specific review of blood clots in US trials, as well as cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which is an extremely rare blood clot in the brain, with the help of an independent neurologist. The London-listed company said the panel found no increased risk of thrombosis or events characterised by thrombosis among more than 21,000 participants. An extreme wet weather up and down the east coast has resulted in flooding and devastation to communities that have recently experienced bushfires and before that, drought. Nurses working in affected areas have been advised to prepare for community members experiencing hardship and mental health issues. New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian says her state is going through some tough times. Some communities who were battered by the bushfires are now being battered by the floods um, and deep drought prior to that. And I don't know any time in our state's history when we've had these extreme weather conditions in such quick succession in the middle of a pandemic. But I know for many people, um, they will feel like it's breaking point uh, when you've been through um, three or four incidents which are life changing on top of each other. It can uh, make you feel like you're at breaking point, but please know we're thinking of you. The speed at which the COVID-19 vaccine rollout is being implemented means it's only natural for nurses to be left with a few unanswered questions. But fear not, APNA's got you covered. We've been in active discussions with the Department of Health for some months now, and we're bringing you that information as we learn it via The Connect, in our COVID webinar series, and of course here on Nursing Australia. Our most recent APNA COVID webinar covered all you need to know about recording COVID-19 vaccinations in the air and reporting side effects. We discussed the information you need to provide, what this looks like in practice software, as well as some broader considerations for COVID-19 vaccination reporting. We were joined by Katrina Otto and Mark Windsor, 
we begin the webinar by giving an update on the advocacy APNA has been doing in the past weeks and trying to get your questions answered. I just want to cover off on a couple of the top questions that have been coming in over the last couple of weeks. The big one is how long can I have a vaccine, a, the AstraZeneca vaccine drawn up in a syringe before I need to use it? We all know the training says you need to draw it up and use it immediately. And we have sought um, for more information on exactly what immediately means. So the link at the top there is also in the uh, key information box on APNA's COVID page right at the top. It's the first link you get to. And I just want to pull out um, some information from that clinical consideration document. And at the moment, it says that each dose should be drawn up and used as soon as practical for each recipient. In this setting, you may uh, pre-draw multiple doses from one vial use and use within one hour if stored at room temperature or within six hours if stored at two to eight. So that's the information that is current at the moment. And as I said, that document's available on our um, COVID page as well. What I also know um, that I, information I got an hour ago was that there's been some new data made available um, around the thermostability for this vaccine in syringes. So that information is now under review by the TGA who are intending on updating the PI, the product information included with the vaccine. Um, AstraZeneca assures me as soon as that information is signed, sealed and delivered, they will let us know so we can communicate that out to you as fast as we can. If it's, uh, it may well come out in the Connect, um, so keep an eye on that. If it comes out midweek, as we know the Connect comes out on a Monday, if it comes out towards the end of a week or midweek, um, we'll push another alert out into your email about that so you have that information at hand. The other hot topic has been the request for a multi-dose um, vial video, uh, a look at how it feels on the ground from beginning to end of the process of drawing up this vaccine. AstraZeneca don't have anything available in Australia on this at the moment, and they have sought um, information from their global organisation and they haven't got anything either. Um, we have communicated to them, this is information that nurses want to see in film, and we're going to continue to talk to them how to try and make that happen for you. So again, if we have information um, on that, uh, we will push it out to you as fast as we can through our communication channels. Now, the next thing is this area of scope of practice around nurses who are authorised or not authorised or enrolled or registered giving COVID vaccine. So as we know, the MBS criteria around this has been made broad to give as many nurses to work to their top of scope of practice and deliver this vaccine. We know that giving vaccines is your everyday business, whether you're an authorised immuniser or not. The legislation that governs nurses' scope around this is state-based. So the things that have changed in um, the ACT, they have made an additional, additional information available around um, midwife and nurse immunisers being able to administer the COVID vaccine. It, they've made an addition to their statement on nurse and midwife immunisers to include that. So for nurses not authorised, there's potential here for standing orders to apply within your um, clinic practice or setting that you're working in. In New South Wales, there is an authority for nurse and midwife immunisers and an authority for registered nurses and registered midwives. They both refer to the statewide protocol for the supply and administration of COVID-19 vaccines um, and standing orders may well apply to nurses who are not authorised, um, but there's no solid framework on that from New South Wales that we can see at this point. In the Northern Territory, it works a little bit differently. So they have um, a COVID vaccine protocol called a CVAP and they also have a government gazetted uh, authority around prescribing qualifications for nurses and midwives. Um, if you're looking at this document, it actually starts off um, with some specific information around health workers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workers and um, health practitioners. And then on page four, it talks about nurses who aren't um, Aboriginal health workers or practitioners as well. Queensland, the COVID-19 vaccine code is up and the COVID-19 vaccine training matrix link is up as well. And they both defer to the drug therapy protocol for communicable diseases program. 
So if you're in Queensland, that's the information you need to have a look at. South Australia has um, a vaccine administration code, but it only applies in certain settings. For those working outside the settings that the code prescribes for, standing medical orders are going to be the, the mode of play there. And South Australia have actually got some information up around how standing medical orders work and also a framework template specific to this vaccine. Tasmania um, are different again, and welcome to Federation. Uh, Tasmania is seeking nurses to support COVID vaccine rollout. The intention was for all nurses um, to participate in this, but at the moment, the information is up specific to RNs and uh, authorised nurse immunisers um, with specific mention that registered nurses can work under um, the supervision of ANIs to deliver this vaccine. Victoria, um, as we know, they had uh, gazetted legislation up very early in the piece to authorise a wide range of health workers to give this vaccine. And they have added to that um, with some guidelines and additional training that's required for Victoria. Same in Western Australia, there's additional training required. So this is on top of the mandatory training that we all know we all have to do if we're playing any role in COVID um, vaccine rollout. Um, and they also have Structured Administration Supply Arrangements, or SASA, um, for ANIs to um, uh, possess and administer this vaccine without a medical order. All of those documents are on the APNA COVID webpage. Um, so if you jump onto that page, go to State and Territory Information, find your relevant state or territory, and there's links to all of those documents there. It's not going to answer all of your questions. Um, and there is still some great area around this, but APNA's advocacy um, is working very hard to clarify this and we're not the only ones doing it. Um, I'm aware that NCs and some other uh, federal oversight uh, groups around administration of vaccines also are hearing the frustration that nurses are expressing around trying to get some clear cut answers of what they can and can't do during this rollout. So I can tell you that this is the new information that's available, it's on our website, but we're not resting here and we will keep looking for more and to get you more clarity. And as soon as we have it, we will push it out through our communication channels. So that's the update from me tonight. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Katrina Otto, the amazing Katrina Otto, um, who's going to talk to some more specifics around what we need to know with all the tech on recording, recalling and reporting for COVID-19 vaccine in general practice. Thanks, Katrina. Wonderful, thank you so much, Suzanne. And thank you everyone for um, welcoming myself and Marg tonight, especially myself as a, not a nurse. I, um, it's an honor to be here. I have a lot of um, technology tips. I'm just gonna throw them out there. I will speak really quickly but please know um, we have created a list of resources. We've created FAQs answering um, some of the common questions we've been getting lately because we are a team of um, two nurses, two admin who are delivering vaccine, vaccine clinics uh, across the country at the minute. So tonight we're going to go through consent. We're gonna talk about, well, I'm gonna talk about the new technology that you might be interested in your clinical software and talk about lots of acronyms, um, PRODA, CVIP, AIR, HPOS. Marg will then take over and talk about designing an effective recall and reminder system and reporting for adverse events and reporting generally in your practices and of course quality improvement because practices improvement is what we're, what we're always looking at doing. So first of all, when it comes to consent, just like to throw this quote out there from Avant, it's not about the form, not about the template, it's a process. So tonight, let's talk about the process a little and know that I have already put the, a PDF of this presentation on my website, Train IT Medical under free resources, COVID, huge, a lot of pages on there at the moment. So you can access it and throughout there are links. So if you wanna go further and look at what event says exactly about consent, download it, click on the links. It's gonna be a lot of information for you tonight. Marg and I sort of broke it down to check consent and communicate. So we need to check whether that, what their vaccine status is, 
Um, we check on air. We can do that via my health record if you wish. Um, we're going to go through consenting, communicating your process and policy, and then um, discussing communicating with your patient about dose two and what does this look like about flu vax and what does this look like? What's your what's your practice um, process? Now, just to start, I'm going to talk about a lot of technology. Health Direct is one. Now, because that really is where we need to start with for your own practice, ensuring your details are updated in the National Health Services Directory. Um, you can link if you have an online, uh, online booking provider, you can link it to that so your patients can find you and then they can book online. Also, the eligibility checker, ensuring that your patients really do assess that they are eligible, eligible before they come to you. So these are the starting points. I also just popped a slide up here of, I imagine, and if there wasn't like 750 people listening, I would ask you what software you all use. As you heard, Marg and I train medical director and best practice, um, obviously hot doc, um, AutoMed, Health Engine, Health Site. These are all third party uh, solutions that I'm sure a lot of you are using. Um, if not, I thought I would just speak very briefly to some of these tools because they have all rapidly developed technology to assist you all with this vaccine rollout. So, what we're talking about is new patients. If they um, are coming to your clinic because their usual GP isn't providing vaccines, they can register through some of these tools. They can complete an online consent. So that is prior to them attending to your clinic. They can check in via these apps. So these are efficiency, technology efficiency improvements. I just popped better consult in there as well because better consult um, and these are obviously all in use for all different sorts of consultations, not just your vaccine clinic. They um, have really come to light in the COVID era because it means patients, you can collect a lot of information from patients via the app. You can receive that and then decide if that's, um, say, accept and that goes into your clinical notes and saves a lot of note taking. So consenting, registration processes, really good technology. Now, just popping up on the screen, Health Engine, just to clarify, now Health Engine is an online appointment provider. However, in addition to that, Health Engine won the government contract to build an online booking system for practices who do not already have one. So I just wanted to clarify that there's been a little bit of confusion. If you already use HotDoc or um, any of the uh, AutoMed health site, any of the existing providers, you do not need to use health engines at all because you use your own. But it is one that has been created. So if you don't already have an online booking platform, then that could be an option for you or any of the others that we talked about. So when it comes to your practice, What's your process? Now, my um, awesome senior trainer, Sue Cummins, has been uh, helping on site with the vaccine clinic. Those of you who have met her before know she is fabulous um, creating checklists and shortcuts and templates. And so we've shared one here that she's been using. And the process, I just thought I'd throw out there to you. What's your process? Confirming the eligibility for your patients in phase 1B, completing the vaccine assessment. So all of this is now for you to design. I recommend clarity at this time. Everybody's frazzled. Um, really important to have clear structure that everybody can follow in the practice. I imagine you're all leading your vaccine clinics. So this is just an example reorder, change, update, look however it looks for you. Record the details in the software, which I'm going to go over in a moment, and any side effects, the waiting time, entering Medicare item numbers and booking the second appointment. And then of course, we've got updating usage, etc. So consider a checklist. 
uh, where Sue's working at Redfern Aboriginal Medical Services, there's four rooms, each room has a different checklist. It's all being co-designed with the team. And there she is. So that's Sue at Redfern Aboriginal Medical Service yesterday getting her vaccine. Um, what a wonderful nurse there, fabulous team. And of course, the very first thing they did was check her vaccine status. So Sue has a My Health record. She's one of the 90% of Australians who do. Um, you can check on My Health record, of course, because the information that's in air flows straight to My Health record. Now I have validation of this because Sue had her vaccine yesterday that was entered into, they use Praxofta Medical Director, that was entered into Medical Director. It was sent to the AIR via Praxoft this morning it was in Sue's My Health record this morning. So My Health record is really going to be a really fabulous tool for you all. It's integrated in most commonly used software. If not, there is a provider portal um, or you can use the AIR directly. And I'm going to talk to you about what's new in that area as well. So remember, information from air flows straight into My Health record. You have a button for My Health record in your common clinical software, access it. You can see other medications your patient is on, whether or not they've already had one or what will be two um, doses. And you could even save that into your software as a record that you checked if, if that patient is not known to you. So all, all nurses, if you haven't already, register for a PRODA account. PRODA is the way we're going to access government services more and more moving forward. It is the way now you can access HPOS online, check if your patient has um, had item numbers billed elsewhere, check if they've had care plans, check if they've had vaccines. Now, when it comes to recording consent, I've just got a picture here of the government um, four page consent form with the link. I've put it like this because you do what you want with this. Now, as I said before, consent is a process, it's not a form. You do not have to have a signed form. However, I'm hearing a vant in my ear again saying, you should absolutely have a signed consent. This is new. What that looks like to you will be different. One practice I was helping on Monday was printing this double-sided and that was the one document they were keeping. The other was for the patient. So whatever all of this looks like for you, some more ideas. You could email the consent link, get patients to complete it at home. Another GP I was working with this week said it was a lot quicker if patients had read all that before they came in, the consenting process. I would like, wish I could hear all your ideas. I imagine that you have a lot to share as well. Uh, we, again, we have created a template, that'd be Sue, has created a template in best practice of medical director that you could import into your software. And there's a link there. It's on the Train IT Medical website. Also, there is a shortcut or an autofill, it's called if you use best practice. And I'll show you that in a moment. I've talked about some of the new technologies. AutoMed has a vaccine management tool. Love to know if you're in, any of you are using that. I've got a picture of that too. So record vaccine encounters with your clinical software. And of course, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. This is what you do all the time. It's really just about, I guess, having um, the COVID clinics remembering that this is a new vaccine, so they're consenting, documenting what you've information you've given to patient, um, ensuring that their questions are answered, just needs that higher level of documentation. And we just th thought we'd throw in some tips for you. So whether you're entering the um, vaccine information, best practice, medical director, whatever software you have, I thought I would just... Um, quickly show you here because you will see it in your software. Number one, store the batch number, save the batch number. That's going to save you time. You probably do that already. 
with your um, vaccines, but you will notice that there is a serial number field. And if you've been to any other of my webinars, you probably heard me talk about a serial number field and the fact that we're likely to have to scan that. Now that is not happening at this early stage, so you do not have to worry about it. Um, the batch number will suffice, but know that the software has this ready for at whatever stage we start to see that technology process come in, but we don't have to worry about it now. So there's that autofill sample. And again, these are just ideas I'm throwing at you, hoping they're helpful. Um, the reason we always start them with a full stop, I'm not sure if that was Marg's tip, which gave me years and years ago. Marg trained me 20 years ago um, with the software. Really good tip because you're, ne you're not likely to ever accidentally type that. Of course, you're typing full stop COVAX, which puts the shortcut in. And the reason it's got the little symbols at the end is because it's really important that you stop and complete that variable information for that particular patient. So again, just giving examples so that you could tweak with your team, make it work for you, hopefully save you time. And there's links to instructions for how to create and use shortcuts well in your software. There is wonderful Denise, um, nurse practitioner from Warren Aboriginal Corporation, another practice we, um, we work with and love um, dearly. This is a brand new fridge awaiting deliveries before the horrid floods they, um, they've just had, the poor thing. So this is a snapshot also of Automed and their vaccine management tool. I would love to know um, if anybody is using this and how you're finding it, but basically you put the, the stock, the inventory in, you attach it to an appointment type and as you, and it, it, it basically keeps track for you of whichever vaccine stock you have. So good technology. Um, but the starting point, really, what we're really focusing on at the moment is the AIR. It is mandatory to upload to the Australian Immunisation Register. As you heard before, easiest, most efficient way to do that is through your clinical software, just the same way that we always have done. I'm so relieved to be able to tell you that they got it working in time. And as I said, with the example, we got proof. Sue so had her vaccine yesterday. It was sent through Praxoft to the AIR, to Medicare, to, and onto the AIR today. It's in my health record. So my health record is your fastest way to see if a patient has already had a vaccine. Failing that, you can go onto Proda to the AIR and access. You have 24 hours in which to upload this information through your practice software or from Proda, get a Proda account to HPOS and AIR. And of course, there's lots of other great features that you can do with that. You need to reconcile, if you are doing this manually, you need to reconcile with your software. Now, another little tip I wanted to put in here was in order for the information to go through successfully when you're sending it through your software, it's really important that you validate your patient details. So this is, this is really um, a quality improvement message to pass on to your admin team. Absolutely vital, especially now that adding new patients, is they have to do that online verification to ensure that those Medicare details are correct. If we have one immunization and vaccine um, encounter go through here and without the details, it'll get stuck. And in best practice, it'll be okay. But in Praxoft and probably some of the other software, it'll hold up the whole entire batch. So make sure that they're doing those Medicare checks, um, validate and to ensure that that's going to transfer successfully. And then within all the software, do a reconciliation check every day as a quality um, control process for admin staff um, with you as the, the leads on this, that that has gone through to AIR. Now, you may have heard there is a new tool called the CVIP. Now, 
I um, wanted to make this bright shining lights. <laughs> this is only for vaccination providers who do not already have clinical software that reports to it. So if you're using Pratsoft Medical Director, Best Practice, Genie, um, any of these major clinical software programs, you will not need this. So I was saying to Suzanne, it would be interesting to have a survey of everyone to see if this is relevant to anybody. Because remember, if you have software that you're sending your vaccines to now, you do not need this, but it has been built for practices who aren't using conformance software. And it does have those big details that patient, um, features that patients can check in and they can review the um, AIR history, barcode scanning, etc. So that's it for me for a moment. I'm going to pass over to Marg Windsor, who will talk to you about designing an effective recall and reminder system. And then we'll come back at the end um, all together for some questions. Thanks, Katrina. <laughs> um, thank you very much for um, having me this evening. Um, yeah, looking forward to representing. So. I'm having a look at the recall and reminder system that we might need for um, our COVID, or we will need for our COVID vaccines. So the first step really is to make sure that we actually sort of have a really systematic team approach to it all, because no one person can probably do it uh, alone. Um, and that systematic team approach should always start with having a look at what our team looks like and designating roles as to um, which... Um, part of the recall and reminder system people will actually be responsible for. Um, once we've actually identified our team, like any good quality improvement program, we should then actually then go on and um, design our processes and systems around our team and then have that very well um, planned and written and develop workflows or something easy so that all the staff and doctors are really aware of what your recall and reminder system is going to look like. Um, when I was thinking about this, I was sort of thinking, well, there's actually probably two parts of it because initially we're going to be very proactive, aren't we? We're going to actually be looking for or re recalling our patients who are actually eligible to start with. So we've got a, pre -active, a proactive approach initially and then kind of reactive to the patients that come in where we're going to set up a recall for them to come back for their second, um, second dose. So um, just next slide, Katrina. Thank you. So we're just having a look. So there's a couple of things to consider when you're actually looking at your recall um, system is, so first of all, knowing the interval between the doses. Now it's for the AstraZeneca, it's recommended between six and 12 weeks, but most of us will be um, at 12 weeks. Um, only have to get special um, consideration if anybody wanted that um, immunization any earlier, but it's not recommended any earlier than that. Um, so when you're actually setting up your recalls and reminders in your systems and processes, one of the first things that you'd probably need to do is define what are you gonna call that simple recall. And it's probably, um, you know, COVID vaccine dose two or something like that. So it's very clearly identified um, within your system. Um, the way we actually do that, so work workflows, there's a couple of workflows up here where um, if we were actually, as we administer the vaccine, um, that that is automatically while we're in the patient's chart, we will actually add that to the to um, the recall and reminder system. Um, the second option is really that we might actually send a message or put a message to um, with our appointment notes and say, could you please add this patient for uh, an appointment in 12 weeks? So we can use our recall system or we can book them in for 12 weeks time um, as they come out of the practice. So that's another way of actually, we've already got them in the recall system. Um, with the second option, if we book them in in 12 weeks' time, most of our um, practice software now has the ability to send SMSs from the appointment book. So we can SMS that patient a couple of days beforehand and say, hey, don't forget that you're um, 
second dose is due. So even though we're putting them straight in the appointment book, there is the ability to still recall them for that. And the first alternative was to pull up a list of our recalls and send an SMS out that way as well. So have a think a little bit about what you're um, going to do with that. Um, it's also good, just sort of thinking of those vax, uh, those recalls again, is how are we going to manage that? So are we going to send out one reminder and then delete the um, recall? Or are we going to delete that recall or reminder when the patient comes back in? Because um, we don't want our recall and reminder system to become overwhelmed with all these second doses. And thinking about how we might actually track those people that don't come back in. What, what sort of reconciliation are we going to do around our recall and reminder list and those that actually come back in? So there's some tools out there and there's some technology um, that's available to us. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with these. Um, you know, we've got our practice management um, software where we can actually go back in and we can reproduce lists that we've sent. We can always pull up deleted recalls. So we can reconcile um, who's come in upon those lists. Um, and our practice management software does have the ability to send SMS messages these days. So that's nice and easy. But you can use those other tools. And Katrina's already mentioned them. They keep on popping up in all sorts of um, areas. But we can use our BP comms, Hot Doc Health Engine, AutoMed, um, tools like PenCat, which actually is great. It links to... Um, it links to top bar, so we can actually identify patients and if patients come in, they can alert, be alerted through our top bar and um, Polar. And Cubico is another um, technology that you might use. But certainly these, um, the PenCat, Polar and Cubico are going to be really, really important in actually identifying um, who's eligible, but also they will actually have some of that reporting for us where we can actually see who's had their first dose, what percentage, and who hasn't had their second dose. So those sorts of things are really, really important. So utilising the technology we have um, to make it easy. The other thing that I would really feel um, very strongly about um, with that second dose idea is how are we going to communicate that? So at the time that we're actually doing the administration of that first dose, have the conversation with the patient that you will need to come back in 12 weeks. Do you understand? We will book you an appointment. Maybe if they, um, we've got a little card that we print out with the first vaccine and the dose that we've signed and given to them as more or less a certificate to say that they've had that first dose, Maybe on the bottom of that, we can also write the recall date or the 12 weeks that it might be in. So letting the patient know and communicating at the time that we're delivering the vaccine, I feel it's probably our biggest tool. We have all the lovely technology, but one of our biggest tools is actually that communication with the patient at the time of the number one vaccine. And it can... Um, yeah, it can really assist us. And yeah, having that conversation and involving that with them and as they go saying, are you sure you know when you have to come back? So, and even the front desk might um, reinforce that 12 weeks idea when they come in. So using communication plus all those wonderful um, technology tools that we can use are important, but nothing can go past that planning phase and having a really good system and workflow around that. Uh, best practice and I know medical director both have a, a pop-up that you can use called an action list. So, and that might be another thing that you could use. So if a patient comes in in between, we can actually look at that. Um, we need to also, I know it's, it's gonna be really difficult, isn't it? Because in amongst all this, because we'll probably get our flu needle. So how are we going to manage the recalls and reminders and inserting our flu needle? The um, other thing too would be in your software as well, with the booking system, have a different way of identifying dose one and dose two. And you might sort of say, well, why would I do that? It's still just a COVID vaccine. 
But when a person is coming back for their second dose, um, it might be a little quicker because we've actually gone through the consent process. The patient is more aware of um, what is going to happen. So that consultation might be quicker. And as the, as the different phases come into our practice, so at the moment we're only up to phase 1B, but as we get to 2A, et cetera, we're actually going to have lots of people coming in for their first dose, we probably will get to that junction where we've got people coming in for their second dose and their first dose. And it's really important to be able to identify in our appointment book, which is the first and which is the second dose. Because as I said, our conversations will change, um, knowing straight away whether I have to add a recall and reminder. But if it's a first dose, it'll be, it'll be different from that second encounter. So think about when you're talking recalls and reminders, particularly in our appointment book, how are we going to identify those practices, those um, uh, reminders and those encounters that we're going to go or the type of consultation that we're going to um, talk about. And now we're going to move on to the, la the this, uh, final section um, where we're going to actually have a look at um, discussing the adverse effects um, from immunisation. And um, I think like many of you, I've been, you know, watching the APNA um, site on Facebook and reading lots of comments and listening to the concerns out there. And I just want to reassure everybody who's in the room, if it's like anything I know, nurses have been immunising for so many years. We are the experts. And in fact, my experience is that the GPs usually sit back and say, we leave that to the nurse because we are conscientious. We have done the training. Um, we actually know what we're looking at. We have done this for a long, long time. So, you know, questions like how will we know or what do we report? Use your instincts because you have actually been reporting adverse effects for a long, long time. The COVID vaccine is new, but it's still a vaccine. So all those principles that we, we know already will apply to this vaccine. So have a think about that and, um, you know, with your reporting. Uh, next slide, Katrina, thank you. So there's lots of different ways of like reporting those um, adverse effects. And it might change from, it will, it probably will change from state to state. The TGA have got a, um, a really good page. And on that page, it's got the list of states and links to the state re, um, reporting of um, adverse effects and their forms that they use. Um, on that website, the patient can go in and do self-reporting as well if necessary. So it might be part of with the, your adverse um, effects reporting is actually saying to the patient, you know, if you feel that you're having more effects or you're having fever or temperature, you may not need to come back ask, to us, but please feel free to go to this website and you can self-report that information because the more data that we collect on this new vaccine is quite interesting. Um, and when I went on the Ausvax safety website, um, you could see that, you know, I think with the um, AstraZeneca, the highest reported adver well, adverse reaction was fatigue. Now, I can't imagine a lot of practices, uh, pa patients coming back to us and reporting it and, and the, the practice reporting that adverse effect. So getting that patient to maybe go to the TGA or your practice may have signed up for SmartVax, which is, a, is free to practices. And if you sign up to SmartVax, they'll send out a little um, SMS survey um, that, and that information is then sent back to um, Ausvax Safety and where all that information is collated. Um, any of you can actually go to Ausvax Safety at the moment and have a quick look at what the reactions are out there at the moment. 
So the adverse reactions that we would report at the practice would obviously be those severe reactions that happen, particularly in that first 15 minutes. And we should be probably, because it's a new vaccine, be reporting anything that happens in that first 15 minutes, just so that we get a really good overview of what this vaccine um, effects it might have. If the patient presents back to your practice with a reason, uh, with a severe um, reaction, um, but not obviously not an anaphylaxis, within 24 hours, I would be reporting that one as well. If they've come back to you unwell, then that needs to be reported um, from our end as well. But if the, if the patient has adverse reaction at home, when they come back for their second vaccine, I would certainly be documenting that in my um, medical record and saying, you know, the patient experienced um, a high temp fatigue and a headache following their first vaccination. So use all that wonderful knowledge that you already have around adverse um, adverse effects um, from in, in immunizations and how we record that. If you're unsure where to send it, a quick phone call to your public um, health unit. Um, I know in Queensland, we're reporting to um, our public health units who are sending it to Queensland Health who will then send it on. So that's what it's like in Queensland, but it can be quite different. But a quick phone call to confirm your pathway of adverse effect um, reporting is really important. I'm sure that if you send it to your, if, I know that if you send it to your state, that it will go to the national um, TGA um, adverse re, um, reporting page and we will actually gain all that data. Okay, next slide, Katrina. Yeah, so we've got the adverse um, effects um, following immunisation reporting, but there's some other reporting that we might be really keen to get out of um, gain from our experience of doing this COVID vaccine rollout. So numbers are going to be really important. How many have we done? How many patients have come through our clinic? Um, keeping track of who have had one and how many followed up with the second one. You know, this is going to be nice data for our um, PIP incentive to make sure that we're receiving that second, um, or getting that PIP incentive. So just having a look at the sheer numbers of people that will be coming through our practice to have their COVID-19 vaccine. Um, other reportings, of course, will be the financial side of things. So going in and doing a search by item numbers, which is fantastic that we've got item numbers, we'll be able to have a look at that and do have a, a look at the financial reporting and how much um, income was generated um, and something might be lost um, by the COVID vaccine um, immunisation program. We've spoken about the adverse um, events that we might talk at. But the other thing that I'd like to sort of talk at is the idea of maybe using, we've got an ideal situation. This is something new to our practice. So going through your quality improvement toolbox that you've probably got, we're all aware of, it, of what we need to do. So what are the quality improvements that we're introducing to our practice to deliver COVID vaccine in a safe, effective um, manner. So having a look at our um, outcomes and doing some really simple PDSAs around that. You can imagine when the accreditation comes next time, we've actually got last year, we've got COVID preparedness for patients coming into our practice. This year, we've got all the um, quality improvements that we'll be doing around delivering vaccines. And in amongst this, we've been talking vaccines and I've been talking numbers and all those sorts of things. But one of the most important things to remember is that this is, this is all about our patients. This is all about the people that we serve. So why not using this opportunity to talk about the patient experience or their outcome from this. So developing a really simple little questionnaire that maybe we can do after the second, second um, 
vaccine to see what the patient experience was like in amongst all this because that is where we'll learn our biggest lessons about what we need to do further with our quality improvement. So there's so much to do isn't there but I'm sure you've got this um, we're all over it um, and I'd like to say in your spare time but I know that there is absolutely no spare time in general practice at the moment but um, I'd like to wish you all the very best with your vaccine delivery and I know that you have that you've got this and you will be fantastic because of your past experience and in delivering vaccines. Okay and just back to Katrina. Wonderful yeah I mean this this week it's been such a um it's it's been such a hopeful hope filled time what I'm seeing is nurses shining um you know every second person I talk to who's had the vaccine says the nurse was fantastic um nurses have got this would be my summary of what I've seen from all these vaccine clinics I've seen um start up this week it's going to be a continual quality improvement in itself keep little post-it notes of what you've changed because you'll tweak your systems as you go can um continually and no doubt if we're used to anything we're used to change right the only constant is change so keep your eye on the apna resources the information the information from your software vendors um, we have a page here of links just that we've referred to tonight in our presentation. So these are just the ones we've referred to um, tonight. So please go and have a look. There is, um, in addition to this, I have like seven pages on my website. So we have a video on HPOS and Proda. We have instructions. This is a really good um, one here, understanding delegations, because yes, you have to have a provider registered with Proda who then can delegate within the practice. So there's another document, help using AIR online. So please access, these are all credible sources, source documents, and that's a link to the website, the free resources. This presentation is on it um, under uh, webinars. There's another page on there now, as well as FAQs. And on the right of the screen here with a link to courses.trainit medical, I've um, what we have here are online courses, um, but these ones are all free. And these are for anybody who does happen to be brand new to entering immunizations in the software. This was a Department of Health funded CSIRO led project, which APNA was very involved in as well. It's just Marg and I um, teaching how to enter immunizations in the software. And this here is still uh, a, one of the webinars I'm most proud of. Marg and I did one year ago on um, managing in COVID times. So that's still there available for you as well. So before we do questions, I also wanted to give my heartfelt thank you to you all. I am with nurses all day, every day. My son is a nursing student. My niece is on the COVID ward. Um, my cousin's practice nurse. My heart goes out to you all and I thank you all for the wonderful work you are doing leading us through this hope-filled time now. Suzanne. Great. Thanks, Katrina. All right. We're going to go to some questions. We don't have a lot of time. Um, so mm -hmm. the one that's um, got the most votes and comments so far is, is there a definitive answer around the best way to draw up vaccine doses, draw up and, and administer with the same needle to ensure the full dose, um, but it can cause more local reactions using the drawing up needle or to change administration needles? Now, the advice is a little bit jurisdictionally dependent on this. In some of the guidelines from your state and territory governments, it will say to use the same needle for drawing up an administration uh, to avoid vaccine wastage. At the end of the day, this is a clinical decision for you in your practice. Um, I know as a nurse, we've always been taught not to recap a needle, so it kind of goes against the grain and I appreciate that. Um, 
what works for you depending on where you have to move to from the point of drawing up to the point of administering may make that decision for you. Um, we want you to be safe. We don't want needle stick injuries um, and we also don't want to waste vaccines. So I think that that one um, at the moment, a lot, most of the advice in most states and territories is around um, using the same needle to avoid vaccine wastage. But if this is not safe where you work and you're going to put something else in place, then um, that, that's okay as well. So yeah, a little bit of a gray answer on that one. And the other one around the syringes was um, if we draw up the uh, syringes in advance, do they need to be labeled? Technically, yes, especially if you're passing that off to another practitioner to administer. So it will again depend on how you've got your clinic set up. Um, in some of the uh, film from the overseas clinics that we've seen, we've had a clinician who's in an aseptic field um, drawing up vial, you know, a vial with the six syringes at a time or depending on how big the vial is to how many doses you get and passing that off. Now, if you're passing a, a syringe to another clinician, um, I think it would be reasonable that that clinician would expect that it would be labelled with all the relevant information about how long it's been out of cold chain and all that kind of stuff. So they know that they're giving a valid dose. If you are drawing up that vaccine and giving it immediately um, and you have the vial with you and all of that kind of stuff, then you would could make the decision that it's not necessary to label the syringe as well. So again, it depends how you've got your clinic set up and how many people you are have involved there. I hope that answers that one. Um, standing orders in New South Wales. I haven't seen anything specific on that. Margot Katrina, have you seen anything specific to New South Wales on standing orders? No. Okay. Um, so I'll take that on notice. Um, if we get anything specific to New South Wales, we will put it up in the New South Wales box on our page. If you want to have a look, South Australia has put up um, a guide and a framework and a template around that. So just to get yourself acquainted with how that might work um, in your jurisdiction, then yeah, look at this, the resources that other states and territories are using um, and, and get, some, get yourself across some of that information. All right, here's a techie one. Um, in general practice, authorised nurse immunisers submit to air and assign themselves as the vaccine provider, question mark, or is this different outside of general practice? Outside, oh, so outside of general practice. So the, from my perspective, it's all about um, inside of general practice and the clinical software that you use requires a... Um, uh, provider number. So you do therefore need to enter via provider number to transmit. Outside of general practice, I would need to look at the specific scenario, whether it's a separate location set up just for a vaccine clinic. Is it a um, like a respiratory hub or what sort of scenario it is? And then look into that further for you. Um, but yeah, in general practice, um, yeah, it is done on from a provider and sent through to the AIR that way. Great, thank you. Um, reporting AEFIs, do we need to report to two departments, the TGA and public health? No, the answer is that they actually talk to each other. So if you, as long as you send in the correct form, it will actually go to the TGA. So you only need to do one form to the pathway that your public health unit or to your state, but that will certainly be passed on to the higher level. So only one form. Yeah, not Great, both. thank you. And in Great. the in the FAQ document that Marg and I put together today, we've listed every single state and territory and um, more explanations about how all that works as well, because we understand there are a lot of questions around that. And also what type of reaction we need to report. So there is a, a lot of questions around that. So we've put the links to the um, definitive answers uh, and the source on that document as well. Great. And just so everybody knows, um, if you listen to this, the recording of this webinar back from the APNA website, you get the slides, you can see them as well. Or if you just want to hear the information again, you can do that on um, the podcast. But yeah, you get access to the slides as well. And as they'll be part of the links, um, Katrina, that we can send out to, to people. Yeah. As well. the yeah. And the Beautiful. slides are already on my website if anyone wants them tonight. 
I just thought that if it's going to help you in your clinics this week, um, yeah, they're yours. Share away in your practices. And yeah, just keep, um, I, I, it's really important that we just keep trying to clarify these nitty gritty details so that we're, um, we're, he, we're clear on the actual answers because otherwise the misinformation spreads and that just makes everyone more stressed. Great, thank you so much. Okay, um, I use best practice and when I open my health record in patient notes, I cannot see air and record. Can you please tell me how or where to see this? Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll add a screenshot of that. I'll write myself a note. I'll add a screenshot from best practice. What it would be, I would say, is your filters. So filters in my health record have really come to light in this um, right now because if you can imagine, this is a whole of life record, my health record. So from birth to imagine one hospital visit, how many documents would be in there. So things are filtered out by default. They're filtered by date range by default. So have a look. I think it's on the left hand side in best practice. Check that it is actually looking for the AIR data. Similarly, with MBS data, that's filtered out by default. But that's one of the most popular things I find doctors are wanting to look at on my health record. Has that patient had a health assessment or care plan? So have a look at those filters and I'll put a, um, a document for how you can do that. In medical director too, you save those filters. It makes it a lot more efficient for you to use on a regular basis. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, what's the best way to give each patient their batch number, serial number and SAFIC phone number so they can report adverse events? What have you two seen out there happening in practices that works well? Um, Susan, on the back of that consent form, I know that the, the Australian government used, there's a, the back page is actually dose one and dose two with all those details. I've actually seen some people um, take, cut get that last page and cut it in half and even have a, you know, sort of, so it's actually something that we can give to the patient. So I don't know whether that could be actually reproduced on, I don't know whether the cardboard's a little bit more stable, but certainly that back page where we're recording that information, I feel should be given to the patient to take with them um, very much as they're, because they may not come back to us for the second dose. Yes. You know, so we've got to take that into consideration. They may go elsewhere. So actually having that record and in actual fact, um, oh, I've just been with the residential aged care facility and one of the questions was, was a certificate supplied to the patient? So they're using the word certificate and that back page looks like a certificate. Okay. Oh, so if you wanted to include information about self, so people can self-report AEF, AEFIs, and you know that's that's really what we want, isn't it? If it's a, a, if it's not an AFI requiring medical attention, but we know the government wants to know as much information about this as possible, um, then you could take that back page of that consent form and you know cop copy what's there, make your own with the with the relevant yep. phone number for your jurisdiction or contact details for your jurisdiction, and, and do and that there so are, you can include that. Yeah. There are some already out there. So there are some record cards out there. I And practices are making their own as well. I even see them making, I've had my COVID vaccine, um, like not a certificate or a sticker, uh, celebration for the patient. But I would like to add on to there, we're not talking about the serial number. Serial numbers are 108 characters long. The reason we are talking about eventually scanning them in is because the risk of Imagine trying to write 808 characters and not make a mistake. So we're talking about batch numbers. Great. Thank you for that. And the TGA, um, there's actually a, um, on the government website, there's a, just a really nice handout you can give to the patient. That post-vaccine um, information sheet has the TGA website to go to, to Susan, that you could give to the patient. So there's resources already developed too. Yep. So the minimum time between dose one and two, I feel like the minimum time might be four weeks in some circumstances, but the optimal time is that 12 week mark. Do you want to answer that one, Mark? <laughs> um, I, I was thinking, yeah, four, uh, six to 12 weeks. I know the AstraZeneca is um, 21 to 30 days for the, oh, sorry, for the Pfizer. The Pfizer. 
Yeah, so the Pfizer is 21 to 30 days. My understanding that it was, um, no, I thought it was. Yeah, it's 12. It is 12 weeks. It's definitely 12 weeks. And then if they, uh, if they do need to um, have the vaccine earlier, then, for example, if they were going overseas, then that is still fine. But the, the guidelines say it is ideally 12 weeks. So mm. I've had a lot of questions about, you know, can they have it earlier? And we are supposed to follow the guidelines. Um, and that's in our um, FAQs as well. So we're supposed to follow the guidelines. You can give it after four weeks, but it is from 12 weeks that has, is showing to be the most effective. We've had a couple of questions come up. What about after 12 weeks? So an example um, in one of the questions is that the patient had their first dose in an overseas country of AstraZeneca vaccine, and it could well be beyond 12 weeks by the time they are eligible um, for the phase rollout in Australia for dose two. So are we happy to give that one a bit late rather than not give it, all, give it at all if it's going to be beyond that 12-week mark? Yeah, I think um, obviously the 12 week mark is the optimum, um, Suzanne, but you know, like any vaccines, doing the full course is better than no course. So I would definitely recommend getting that second vaccine, even if it was over the 12 weeks. Listeners can find the links to the slides and the resources in the show notes of this episode. For our next webinar, we're assembling a star-studded panel of experts to answer your questions in hour long Q&A. It's on the 14th of April. Keep your eye on the Connect newsletter for registration details. Also, in the show notes, there is a link to subscribe for the Connect if you aren't already subscribed. 2021, Year of the Ox? More like Year of the Vaccine. Let's continue to protect the community against COVID-19 together. Members receive priority news alerts from key vaccine experts, access to APNA's COVID webinar series and a competitive insurance offer to ensure your career is protected. Renew your membership and add professional indemnity insurance today. Did you know that 387,000 Australians will experience stroke in their lifetimes? That's a stroke every nine minutes in our country. The first point of contact for many people experiencing signs of stroke will be in primary care. I asked the Stroke Foundation to tell us what primary care nurses can do to turn these numbers around and what we should do when faced with a patient presenting with signs of stroke. Today we have Madison Trudell from the Stroke Foundation with us um, on Nursing Australia. Thank you so much for being here to help give nurses the best information that's available around stroke. So let's start with the basics. You were a practice nurse and now you work for the Stroke Foundation. So tell us about what the Stroke Foundation does. So the Stroke Foundation is a national charity um, and we're the voice of stroke in Australia. And pretty much we raise awareness of stroke um, and work with the community to try and prevent stroke, save lives and enhance recovery. So what are the risk factors that are impacting on someone's likelihood to have a stroke? Yeah, so definitely having had a TIA or a stroke before will put you at risk for another one, but also things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, um, atrial fibrillation, which is the irregular heartbeat where your blood doesn't pump properly and a clot can form. Um, unhealthy diet, a lot of salt and saturated fats, physical inactivity, smoking, and excessive alcohol cons consumption. Um, and it's important to know that 80% of strokes can be prevented. So that's why if we look at those risk factors and find our patients that are most at risk for, for stroke or even cardiovascular disease, um, that we can really help to prevent this from happening. Um, and that's why primary care nurses do play a big role as they can identify the risk factors, educate, um, and escalate any concerns. Okay, so the, the word stroke and the diagnosis of stroke is pretty common, mm -hmm. but the other thing that we hear about is a TIA. Yep. So I'm not sure, like, what's the difference there? What is a TIA? How does it differ from stroke? Yeah, so a TIA, it stands for a transient ischemic attack. Um, and 
It's been referred to as a mini stroke. That's what a lot of people in the community will refer to it as. But in the medical community, we try and stick with TIA. Um, and it happens when the blood supply to your brain is blocked temporarily. Um, it can be a few minutes, it can be several hours, but when the blood supply stops, the brain cells in the area start to shut down and you have signs and symptoms similar to a stroke, but it reverses itself over time. So that's, that's what a, a TIA is. Um, and after a TIA, your risk of stroke is about 30% higher. So we like to tell people that it's actually a sign that bigger things are coming. Um, and it's also a big education moment for patients to kind of look at what they're doing, definitely look at their risk factors. Um, and this is a time where it's really important for to be on medications if they need to, to reduce um, blood pressure and cholesterol. Um, and so, yeah, so that's why a TIA can be quite important. So what's what's the top of what's at the top of your list of the things we need to be looking out for when we're suspecting um, stroke or TIA in patients in the primary healthcare setting? Presentations that we have an acronym for. So we use the acronym FAST, F-A-S-T. The F stands for facial drooping. So that's important to check their face to see if their mouth is drooped. Um, if you notice anything different about just the symmetry of their face. A is for arms. Can they lift both their arms? Um, sometimes one side of the body will be paralyzed. Um, and so it's important in that instance that you're making sure that person is safe as well. Um, S is for speech. Is their speech slurred? Can they understand you? Are they making sense? Sometimes they'll think that they're making sense, but you know everything that comes out is just a jumble. Um, and then T stands for time because it's really critical um, to get them to a hospital as soon as possible and just call triple zero. Um, and like you said, there are different presentations um, besides the fast signs. Um, so people can have weakness, numbness, paralysis, um, dizziness, loss of balance. You can have a thunderclap headache, which is common with hemorrhagic strokes, um, loss of vision, double vision, or decreased vision. So there are a lot of different presentations. The main thing is if there's anything similar to that, anything neurological, it's just important anyway to call to call triple zero and get them scanned as soon as possible. Um, we don't know the difference between a TIA or a stroke until the patient actually gets scanned in the hospital. So that's why we like to say a TIA is just treated as a stroke. We can't rule it out until they're in the hospital. So if we've established that the patient, patient in front of us does have signs and symptoms of stroke or TIA, what should we be doing in primary care? What, what are we going to do with that patient right then and there? Yeah, so the most important thing is obviously first make sure they're safe. Like I said, you can have an affected side, so you don't want them falling out of a chair, falling. So, you know, they need to be safe to begin with, but you need to call an ambulance as soon as possible. And the best thing to do when you're calling an ambulance is actually say that you have someone that's showing signs of a stroke because that should escalate their response to you because it is a medical emergency. Um, you can do things like observations, um, you know, blood pressure, but the, the ambulance is going to be doing that anyway. So making sure that the patient is, um, you know, safe, making sh sure they know that someone is coming to help and, and just making sure that you have all of their history printed out for the ambulance when they come. So you can do a quick handover and they can get them straight to the hospital. Some people ask as well if you should be giving any type of medication. Um, and because we don't know, one, if they're having a stroke or we don't know what type of stroke it is, um, we don't give medication. Um, just because if someone's having a hemorrhagic stroke and we give something like aspirin, that actually could make it worse because it's an antiplatelet. Um, and so we really wait until they get to the hospital, have that imaging done, and then that call is made.
Awesome. So we're going to do good assessment. Mm -hmm. We're going to do some observations. We're not going to give antiplatelets. Yeah. And if we do decide um, to get IV access, we're going to do it in the unaffected limb. Yep, that's exactly right. Great. OK. Um, this is, you know, you, you've done a great job of explaining um, the things that we can do, or what we should be recognising and what we can do um, with patients in primary care. And also thinking about how we lower risk factors for people representing with stroke or presenting with their first stroke. Um, mm -hmm. That chronic disease management stuff is really important. So thank you so much, um, Madison, for being with us on Nursing Australia today. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. When looking for the best support for my patients following stroke, I found Enable Me. It's a brilliant resource hosted by the Stroke Foundation for people with stroke and their families. And if you need to upskill, check out Inform Me, the Strokes Foundation's learning suite for you to learn about stroke management, prevention and post-stroke care. The links for both of these resources are in the show notes of this episode. This podcast is brought to you by APNA, the Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association, and is only made possible by our members. Join today. Google APNA membership. Who has the time to wade through every piece of healthcare news? Primary healthcare nurses certainly don't. Fear not. APNA's weekly Connect e-newsletter condenses key industry news into digestible content while serving up a feast of useful resources. Stay in the know and save time. Subscribe for free at www.apna.asn.au. Looking after our own well-being is so important. Nurse Sarah Cosgrave is back to give us some ways to chill out and take some time for ourselves. I want to share with you two relaxation tools. Within the Natural Nurse Project, a big focus is nourishing the carer within. And as you know, so often as nurses, we don't prioritise our care for self. And I really want to share two really handy tools that you can use before, during or after your shift and also in your day-to-day -day life, which is awesome. So these tools focus on neurovascular points, ultimately supporting you to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest and creating calm and clarity for you. You can do this in your own in a quiet space so placing everything out of your hands sitting up with your feet on the ground closing down your eyes bringing your hands into two balls pointing your index finger and third finger on both hands Place these fingers one centimetre above the internal edge of your eyebrow. So where your eyebrows meet towards your nose, just one centimetre above this. Here, gently place your fingers. These are neurovascular points. These are your ESR points, emotional stress release points. By holding these down simultaneously, bilaterally, left and right above the eyebrow, you're activating the parasympathetic nervous system and depending on how long you hold these points, you may start feeling a pulse. Ideally, holding these points gently for 30 to 60 seconds. So as you're holding in this position together, we're going to take three deep breaths in and out, noticing whilst we do this how you're feeling and how this is supporting you. So breathing in for three, two, one, and out for three, two, one. Breathing in three, two, one, and out. For three, two, one. Breathing in, three, two, one. 
and out. Three, two, one. And gently bringing your hands down. Scanning down your body and just feeling any sense of change. These are your ESR points. Really handy. So with your arms down now in a similar fashion, I'm going to talk through this next tool. So bringing your right palm over your entire forehead and your left palm over the occipital lobe at the base of the back of your head. So your elbows are pointing up. And just noticing how you're feeling in this position as we join together in breath, breathing in for three, two, one, and out for three, two, one, breathing in for three, two, one, and out for three, two, one, breathing in for three, two, one, and out for three, two, one. And relaxing your arms down, but also I'd invite you to maintain this position as feels best for you. So there are a lot of neurovascular points beneath these hands in this position. As we know, when we're stressed, we're activating our reptilian brain, our amygdala, fight and flight. And this specific tool is bringing focus to our frontal lobe, um, focusing on calm and supporting us to navigate more clearly in a new and often challenging time during COVID. So thank you for allowing me to share and I hope that you can take these tools away and continue supporting you to nourish the carer within. Thanks so much, Sarah. If you'd like to know more about the Nurtured Nurse Project, find a link in the show notes of this episode. Well, that brings us to the end of the 10th episode of Nursing Australia. We hope you're enjoying the podcast. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. I'm Suzanne Blackaby. Nursing Australia, the podcast for Australian nurses working together towards a healthier Australia. For more information, please visit us at www.apna.asn.au. Thanks for listening to Nursing Australia.